or anything you'd like to take out of order on the agenda? Okay, if you don't speak up, I'm going to just assume you don't have anything to tell me. And so we'll just start on the agenda. Current use statistics and the possibility of developing a regular report. John Krause. And John, you also left last our last meeting with a couple of homework items, I know. Maybe you can update us about status. Uh, on those reports, um, that really was with the jail. We were going to check in to see how the jail, when they capture information, we'll check with their database, it's called Spillman, and uh, see what kind of with uh, Lieutenant uh, Erickson. And really what it comes up with is that we asked about some reports or statistics and off the top, we thought about uh, what we'd like to capture such as new charges while on release and failure to appear for court. And <clears throat> Lieutenant Erickson said they, they capture a lot of the defendants that come into the jail. Of course, they book them in and they put them in that database spillment. And, uh, but the spe specify to get those specific reports, he would have to increase his hard drive and get specific software for those kind of uh, breakdown and statistics and a, a staff to help interpret the raw data, such as a statistician or something like that. So at this point, they can't collect what we would want without those additional um, hard drive software and a personnel or some sort of staff designated for that. So does that help? No, uh, no, it really doesn't because I'm not sure what to do. We need this data. Um, Andrew Peterson, what's your take on that? Uh, hi, Judge Garrett, sorry. I came down with COVID last Friday. Um, and so uh, recovering a little bit, today was my first day back. Um, Are you okay to be here? I mean, yeah, I, I think so. Although, I, yeah. if, you, if you have asthma, I don't recommend getting COVID. No. Uh, oh, I hope you didn't get too sick, but it sounds like you did. Uh, we're, we're okay. Uh, the recovery is a little uneven, but we're moving in the right direction. Okay. You and your uh, family, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everyone tested positive the same day. So, that was, uh, uh, so okay, anyways, well. anyways, that's personal stuff. But um, I mean, I think, I think some, so, I sent out a, a, a document um, to Jill, uh, I think on the 10th, so two weeks ago, uh, that, was, that was part of my homework. Uh, and, that, and that's the same type of document that um, the, the Thurston and Pierce sites have used yes. uh, to rank you know, what, what they want to measure. And the elements in it come from um, the measuring, what's ma measuring what matters, a document that was created by the National Institute of Corrections, part of the, the Department of Justice. And, um, you know, I think that's probably, I, I don't know, my opinion is that's where uh, we should start and look there for one, what's important to, uh, you know, everybody here uh, to, you know, what, what you want to measure um, in terms of performance and outcomes of, of the various departments and, and you know, of the, the defendants that come before you. And then once we know that, uh, what, what's important and maybe not as important or, or less of a priority, we can start to figure out, you know, what are the sources that can be used to access that data? And um, yeah, some of it would come from the jails, uh, but I don't know that they have to be the ones to do all the calculations. Um, there oh. are some, sorry, go can, ahead. Can I interrupt for just a second? Of course, please. I want to be sure that, um, that we're all on the same page. It's my understanding that the data we need is, first of all, um, for each, we need data on the qualities or attributes or, or history, whatever you want to call it, uh, that are listed in the various items in the risk assessment tool. And we need information from the jail about uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds of the various defendants who are, well, really all defendants, not just those uh, utilizing pretrial services, so that we can be sure that we're not, um, you know, 
having a disparate impact on any particular group. Beyond that, what other qualities do we need to be keeping track of? I guess I don't mean qualities, but what are the other, other, other factors we need to know besides those? Sure. Uh, you know, there are, I mean, it, it could, the answer could be a lot or none. Um, so the, there may be things within pretrial services that you want to measure from simply caseload to, to, you know, to making sure that you know, pretrial services is not getting overwhelmed or understanding you know, when they may need to add another person um, to looking at uh, defendant outcomes. So incorporating uh, court, whether it be court data or arrest data, however you want, want to measure offending well, well awaiting trial. So people that are out on release, um, how you want oh, to- Oh yes, we definitely want that. I'm sure. just, yeah, I don't mean to overlook that or underrate it. No, of course. And, and it's hard because, you know, you think about it and you, you may, you know, you're thinking about the data and it's hard to look holistically, right? When you're, when you, because you may be focused on one area or another, um, but there, you know, there can be things of, you know, along lines of, uh, so failure in terms of a new offense or a failure to appear warrant being issued or a technical violation, maybe, you know, that might be something you want to track or maybe you don't, you know, maybe that's not as important uh, to your group. Um, there are also uh, issues like uh, how often does the judge follow the matrix? You know, so maybe the, the, the risk assessment recommends a certain level of supervision, but the judge overrides that. Is that something that your group cares about? Um, those instances and, and what happens, you know, do those cases have different outcomes or the same outcomes? Um, that one sounds more like something that would be in the realm of fine tuning. After we've sure. got some of the more basic statistics down, unless you recommend keeping track of, you know, as many, as many features as possible at the same time. What I guess what I'm trying to do is make this as simple as possible for at least initiating our statistics gathering. Absolutely, sure. So, uh, you know, I think getting my opinion is fine, um, but, you know, I'm not the one, it, this is not my area and not my, not my jurisdiction. Uh, so I, I would feel better if, you know, the group went through individually. That makes sense. And, and so everybody rates their own and, you can send, I don't know, I don't, Jill speak if I don't want to violate any public meeting things, but I would be comfortable if, uh, if you, everyone took the, the spreadsheet, rank those from one to 24. Uh, if you want, if you want to draw lines in there and say like, definitely this, or, you know, uh, any, everything above number 10, yes. Uh, below 10, I don't care so much, or, you know, however you want to do it in a way that's clear. Um, to me, then send those to me and I can compile the information and, and then put together like, you know, one list that gives kind of an aggregate of everyone's opinion um, and, and, you know, resubmit that and have everyone look over it and, you know, make sure there's nothing that stands out one way or the other poorly. Um, and then, and then once we know, you know, kind of what are the essentials or high priority areas, uh, we can focus on those. And, and then maybe the secondary, you know, maybe there's a secondary kind of list that uh, is, you know, if great, if we can do it, maybe it's not so bad if, if it's not easily done or, you know, we try and figure out a way to get to that later. Dr. Peterson, Jill Nixon here. I have this um, uh, table pulled up. I can screen share with the group if that would be helpful. It's sure, sure. And it, I, you know, to me, it doesn't have to be so, I, again, I don't want to violate any uh, public meeting or, or those kinds of issues, but- Oh no, you're totally fine. That's okay. totally fine. And this, this is in their meeting packet. So if any of you have your agenda and meeting packet in front of you, this is uh, included in there. Yeah. This is the document that you're referring to, correct? Th that looks right. Yep, that looks okay. Okay, um, great. Yeah, and so, the idea would just kind of be um, put a put a ranking from their 20, 24 items on there. So rank those one to 24. Uh, if any of those are not clear to people, you know, send me a note and I'll, I'll, um, 
I can send out some better explanations, you know, more detailed explanations of what those mean or what's intended there. Um, and you know, I, to me, it's, it's not something that would happen in this meeting. I, I would want people to kind of take some time and think about it uh, as they're going through it. Uh, but it's 24, so hopefully it doesn't, you know, hopefully it doesn't eat into too much of your time. Um, and then, yeah, once those, once you're done with those, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, send them to me, and uh, and I can try and put together a list that you know, represents the the average of of everybody's views. Um, and then we can figure out, you know, where those elements, you know, how how we get those, how do we get to those those that we you have deemed essential or, or most important uh, in measuring. Um, and then once we know that, then we can, you know, start to lay out the, make it, start to make it happen. Yeah. That makes sense to me. You know, this is Judge Garrett. I, I'm having technical problems on this end. I'm going to sign off for just a moment and sign back in. So um, you can continue the discussion, please. Um, I, I'm not able to see, well, I'll come back in and tell you what my problems are. Uh, please continue the discussion. I'll be right back. I just had a simple question. This is John. Uh, do you want us to rate them one through 24 or like one out of 10, the importance of it? Uh, hmm, good question. Or one out of five or something like that. I, you know, I would rank them one to 24. Um, mm, although you, I kind of like your suggestion. Uh, maybe that's a better approach. Maybe we'll keep it even simpler. Like uh, do each one like a one through three, right? And I'll, I'll send this to, to Jill and she could forward instructions, but you know, one being high priority, three being lowest priority, yeah. uh, two being somewhere in the middle. Does that seem fair? Yeah, I just was like, boy, there's some, ones I don't know how to rank there three or five or four <laughs> yeah no, exactly so, okay. um yeah uh, and I, I don't want to make it too complicated and start doing like multiple columns where you've got one through 24 and then not importance level so let's just let's do that I like your suggestion John let's let's um I'll I'll send this out again just so everybody has it in writing when they're doing it and we don't have to rely on our memories uh but yeah I thought like the one rank everyone one through three high priority one being highest you know, highest priority in measuring three being lowest. Um, and then I'll okay. kind of compile those. Can it uh, be put in an Excel spreadsheet once they send it out so we can fill it in? Would that work? Yes, I, I will. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Can some of them we put a zero on? <laughs> I mean, they're, I mean, there's stuff <laughs> like defense represented first appearance. That's all. Yes. I mean, we know all that. Time to first appearance. We don't care. There's a some. Can we just put that that aren't that we're never going to need? Do you, I'm sorry, Dave. Do you mean like it, it's already being done? We don't have to worry about it. Or well, no. Like, it's stuff like we really don't care about. Oh, I mean, okay. It's done. I, I mean, it's like I don't know what defense representation or first appearance means. We I, it just represented means like, everybody. Yeah. How um, many? How many yeah. of those at their first appearance have a defense attorney present? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will. Uh, I mean, I think for that, just rank it a three. Then you know, if if you don't care about it, um, you know, that's low. Yeah, actually, I kind of wanted to. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I, I guess there's just some that I don't think we're ever going to need. Um, but sure. I, I mean, I just don't want us to like have to pick through a, a bunch of threes. But yeah, that no, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, hope, yeah. Hopefully, there aren't too many threes, uh, or or if there are, that's fine. Actually, so we'll do it. We'll take it in order then. So we'll work. Worry about group one. You know, all the ones. Um, we'll worry and make sure we have those. The the twos. You know, if we can get them easily, great. Uh, and then something like if the threes. You know, whatever. They, they we won't worry about them. Something like that. Doctor Peterson, this is Stephen. Um, I have two questions. Um, first is. What I don't see here is capturing any demographics on people who are not released. So we don't have that comparison between the groups, um, which seems important to me. We, we can tell what percentage of defendants were released and sure. what the demo demographics were, the people who were released, but, but we, can't, we can't see how equitable those releases were. 
Uh, good oh. question, Stephen. Yeah, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but you're right. I don't see anything uh, right now. So let me pencil. I'll pencil that in. Um, okay. And maybe we can make it part of. Uh, you know, I think the the first one maybe was was uh, demographics of those on release pretrial population. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can kind of put a, a slash in there. So instead of it being um, just a a uh, a percentage, you know, that the, the pretrial population was fifty percent white, you know, whatever. Um, have it be a comparison to those that uh, to, to the total jail population or the total pretrial pop the total what I want to say uh, booked population. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll trust you to give that a little more thought because there are those are different slices and dices. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I. It it does. It does also seem to me relevant uh, to know how often the judges are departing from the guidelines um, and to sort of be able to track the outcomes when that happens as well. Uh, and, and lastly, I'll just say I agree with Judge Garrett's comment that this should be as simple as possible, but I think part of being simple is not having to go to the extra work of doing all the ones and then figuring out later that we want to add some twos and, and having to go back and reconfigure all our data gathering process um, when we could have done a little more thoughtful job at the outset. You're right, Stephen, it's a balance. If there's something that doesn't seem critical in the beginning, but we know we're gonna want it eventually, we might as well go for it now. Yeah, that was my point, exactly. Yeah. Um, just an administrative thing. Can any of you see each other? I'm getting an error message that says the host has shut down video. Jill Nixon, are you behind this? I'll check the settings and, and there might be a setting off wrong. So give me a minute to. Okay. At first I thought you were trying to spare the group from having to look at me, but I think <laughs> not any of us looking at each other. Okay, now give it a try. Okay. Hey, there's everybody. Sorry Indeed. about that. Okay, Zoom may be impersonal, but still more personal with picture, with you know, with people's images than just voices. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay. So um, I missed out on part of the discussion. What is our plan for the use of this form that Jill has uh, so usefully put up on the screen? Are we going to complete these on our own and send them in? Or do we want to have some discussion now? Um, I'm not doing very well in terms of keeping the agenda. I neglected to print a copy of the agenda, so I have it on my screen, but I can't seem to get to it. Um, Jill, you're wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, I'm just looking at the other items that we have on our agenda. It seems to me that, why, why don't we do this? Why don't we, move to item three, data analysis, because I suspect that's going to blend in with item item one. Let's cover that, uh, item three. Then let's brainstorm a bit about prioritizing on this form. We can also send, you know, updated comments later, but I'd, I'd like the benefit of the group's discussion as we go through the, the list that we just had on the screen. So, um, to make sure that we use our time most effectively, Let's talk about data analysis. And then um, we can either move quickly to defining violent crime or go back in, into the main statistical questions. Is that okay with everybody? Again, hearing no dissent, um, that's what we'll do. Um, Andrew, that puts you on the hot seat again. Do you wanna talk about uh, pretrial performance and outcome measures. And then uh, John will be talking to you too about um, whether Whatcom County's current measurement system is gonna work for us. 
but Andrew, why don't you start? Sure, thank you. So, so again, this kind of feeds into what we were just talking about. So I, I, I right now don't, don't know which elements here. I mean, what I have is basically the same information that John has. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm happy to, and he knows it a little bit better because he, you know, he's at, at closer to the ground. So I, I'm happy to defer to him unless there are other elements in there um, that going forward, I'll start reporting on. John, do you want to chime in? Uh, are we talking about ranking or discussion about the ranking in the, these items or data? Now? What, what exactly are you asking? Um, well, Jill, can you move up on the agenda again? Yeah, we're on item three and the, the pretrial performance and outcome measures, um, which kind of merge into number one. Um, I don't know. It, yeah, I kind of I, see maybe uh, what I could probably say is the second bullet under number three, which uh, I had mentioned in the last meeting about an upgrade. Our system is being upgraded uh, this year sometime. And it's gonna be very comprehensive. Com they gave us a little uh, little module just to show us what they'll be doing or what it's capable of. And they went national and they were, they were actually running New York City's probation and pretrial system in the state of New Jersey. And so they're, they're pretty serious and they've got a software that can do a lot, it sounds like. And if, I think if we narrow down what we wanna start collecting, um, we can approach our, it's called Autumn and the software company and say, can you tailor make this for us specifically? And they can build that in when they transfer over that new system along with all, you know, everything we have in the current one will be transferred over along with all the defendants currently in our caseload. And then they'll probably give us some training on helping develop some of those stats that we are looking for. Um, and uh, so I'm thinking we can capture uh, much of it. If they're assigned to pretrial services, of course, if it's generally all defendants and new arrestees, we're only collecting the ones that are on assigned to pretrial services. So that's our population that we would be hitting here. Uh, so, I th but I, I'm confident that they can tailor make it to some of these, uh, because some of these performance measures along with uh, outcomes, a lot of other jurisdictions are using it around the country. So it's kind of an expected uh, statistic that uh, they're, they're putting into the software. So does that help? Yeah, it does. Anybody else have a, a comment? I would just add, I think that's the same software that Thurston County is using uh, with the PSA. And so that's, that's a good sign. Uh, yes. Pierce County has their own system that they use all the way you know, through the system. But um, yeah, the, the Thurston is, it brought this in, I think, specifically with the PSA. So. Um, that's helpful. So this goes back to my earlier comment. John, is 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 this software just for use in the pretrial services unit, or is it capturing court data as well? Because it, it's it's too narrow a picture if we only know who got released. Yeah, it captures only pretrial services, and the state system doesn't share anything with our private software here from a private vendor. So um, to collect failure to appears, we'd have to manually go in on each case that are on pretrial services or specifics. We'd have to manually go into the state system and duplicate it into our software. I guess I'm less concerned about that than knowing, I mean, it's not enough to know that 80% of the people sent to pretrial services are white. We would need to also know, um, you know, whether that's disproportionate with those who continue to be detained pre-trial. Right. And, right. You know, and I think maybe that'd be a, if we narrow down and we let the jail know what we want, and they maybe can budget in 
certain software or something to collect that. I don't know. Um, it's not impossible for them because they do enter all that information is captured on new arrestees, all the demographics that they can collect at the time. Um, ours is duplicated from whether it's Spillman or the Odyssey state system. From, that's the Odyssey software for the state. You know, I know, I know, sorry, go ahead. Um, I was just going to ask John, uh, John, Dave Reynolds is not with us today, but can, can you talk with him and together the two, the two of you or one of you, but on behalf of our court, um, talk to the, the, the person you're dealing with at the sheriff's office to find out about the potential for getting some of that data? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a Dave Reynolds level um, right. approach because it's it's for the court in general and I want everybody to be on the same page. But the, if you and Dave Reynolds can take that one on, um, I think you can start to get the information we need. Okay. Judge Garrett, can I ask a question? Sure. Is is I have Carol? not been in, it's Carol, yeah. Hi, Carol. I have not been in this loop high at all. Is there, is there any place where the planning around data collection for pretrial services overlaps with any of the work that's happening with the index committee for the task force? Boy, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know. I think so, but I don't know. Stephen, can I, can I bring you in on that? Well, uh, my my first reaction is that it should definitely yeah. um we've asked for all the pieces in the continuum of the system to feed reports into index um so whatever john is spitting out of pretrial services unit ought to go to caleb uh for inclusion in in a bigger reporting out uh process um but I, I don't know that we have those channels uh, built yet, so to speak. Um, Are you on so the index committee, Stephen? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were. No, I, I just hear what Caleb reports in the steering committee and, and mo mostly there. Okay. And I don't know if Dave Reynolds is on it, on that committee. He was at one point, but that was a while ago and I, I just don't know. Do you know, Stephen? Uh, I don't. If, if I could okay. suggest, may, maybe it would be worthwhile to invite Caleb to one of our next meetings here um, and, and talk about the intersection uh, between what we're doing and what he's doing. I think that'd be great to invite him in and get some, we're relaying what he tells us. So, but I think if we could really have some really good questions. What exactly can we start collecting or how, or what do you need? Or I think that'd be great to hear from him. We should invite him to the next June meeting. I, 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 I agree with John. And, and I, I will say that uh, there's this uh, parallel effort going on in the stakeholder advisory committee for the, uh, I'll, I'll call it the jail planning process uh, for the 2023 ballot initiative. It's not just the jail, it's, it's all the other services to divert and treat. Um, and they've made some pretty significant advances mapping out uh, our criminal legal system data and the behavioral health system data. And Caleb's been in the thick of that as well, uh, along with Dr. Alexis Harris from UW. And, and Jeremy uh, Martin from uh, EMS. Uh, there's some really high level data development in the works there and Caleb may be able to inform us about that as well. Okay, um, I will talk with uh, Dave Reynolds about these things. That's not a substitute for your discussion with him, John, but I'm gonna talk to Dave about these things. And I'm also going to contact um, or ask Dave to contact Caleb and invite him to the next meeting. 
And John, if you'd like to contact Caleb, you can do that too. Uh, if he gets more invitations, he's more likely to come and it would be nice to talk with him. Now, when is our next meeting, Jill? The next meeting is June 22nd. Okay, so that, what, that's four weeks from today. Okay. Okay. Um, other, other comments or discussion? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the to the next item, but before we do, I just want to recognize that it's nice to see you again, Carol, even if I can't see you. Um, and I see that Bruce Van Glubt is with us again. Nice to have you here, Bruce. And uh, your court is definitely changing and uh, we're all watching with interest, but I hope things are going well. Thank you. It's good to, uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I, I put my camera on, except I'm actually zooming in on a vacation day and I'm puttering around the house. And so I don't think you all need to watch me wander around the house and putter. So anyway, it is good to see everybody. Thank you. It's good to have you here puttering or not. And <laughs> um, lastly, I wanna welcome back Dave Graham, who is again, the representative of the prosecuting attorney's office. And it's nice to have him back too. Hi, Dave. Hi, thank you, Judge Garrett. Good. Okay, and of course our stalwarts, uh, like Maya and Stephen and um, Adam, we're all here. And the most stalwart of them all, Jill is here. And of course, Dr. Peterson. So it's nice to have everybody here. And uh, I feel like we're, we're not our full committee, but we're a good core. Um, let's, what, what else do we need to do to figure out Excuse me, I'm getting a phone call that I'm gonna stop. Yeah, okay. Um, what else do we need to do to finish the discussion we can have today on data items one and three? Have we covered as much ground as we're gonna be able to cover? I guess I just have a couple things to add. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've actually been in charge of doing all the first appearances now. So I basically see every case that comes into the jail is booked. I'm also reviewing and assigning all the out of custody cases, uh, which ones are not going to the jail. So I've been seeing a lot. Um, I guess three things, I, I've been doing that since February. Our biggest concern right now is people picking up new felonies uh, while they're out. Um, yeah. I, know, I know we had Dr. Peterson run a stat a couple of years ago. I thought it was 50%, it was like 48%. Eric and I were just talking the other day, we guesstimate it's up to 70, 80%, maybe higher. I mean, it seems pretty much everybody on our three o'clock calendar comes through the jail now as a pending felony, whether it's here or not. Um, Wait a so minute, Dave. Dave, yeah. I'm sorry, your voice, can you say the last sentence again? Seems like everybody on the three o'clock calendar, what? It has a pending felony. Uh, ah. it's, very, it's very rare. It's a rarity now to see someone who doesn't have a pending felony. Oh, okay, those so we're usually, well over 50%. Yeah, well, yeah. well th okay. those are usually assault two domestics. Um, a lot of our child porn cases, stuff like that, we don't see, but majority all, all have. The other thing I was kind of looking at, we were, we're tracking stats. What's really gonna to be tough now in Superior Court is that people really only have to show up twice now, basically once at arraignment and then at their actual trial date. Um, the other dates, they don't have to show up anymore per the, per the court rules it's gonna be really tough to track like a successful appearance because they don't have to show up. And then even if they don't show up, like I just finished the status calendar today, you know, we, we had a lot of people FTA, but there's, we can't issue warrants now. It just moves to the trial calendar. So I'm curious how those are gonna be counted because if there's no warrant, it's technically a successful appearance when it really isn't. So I think that's gonna take some fine tuning when, when we look at stuff is, how we're going to count appearances and, and not we can't just look at bench warrants um, on there the other thing our office is having some trouble with is that one or two of the judges have told us these pretrial violation hearings are not mandatory appearances per their other court rule of the arraignment and trial date so i know we've stopped doing some of them because if the defendant's not going to be there it doesn't really do any good um, so those are just kind of the three concerns I have. I guess two are 
pretty much related to the stats. We're very curious about um, how many people are committing new felonies while they're out. Um, and that, that's going to be tough to track because, you know, we also, the people who are arrested are not being booked that we're summonsing in, you know, so I think we are going to need to look at Odyssey and basically track all the cases. Um, and then, yeah, we, we do have to figure out some way to try to track appearances. Because I, I think it's going to be kind of unique to try to do it now. Those are complicated questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking slowly because I'm writing a note. I'm going to talk with Judge Freeman about some of this. Uh, I'm not as up to date as um, you and certainly Maya are about um, pretrial appearances. But um, you said that if a person doesn't come for their, their confirmation hearing, basically, there's not a warrant the the case is simply put over to their trial date. It, yeah, that that's it, right? well, well, it's a status hearing. We also have trial confirmation. So we have status yeah. hearings. And then if that time at status hearing, the defendant does not have to show up for the omnibus or status. If it's confirmed for trial, then we set a trial confirmation. But those, those are different things. But at the status, they don't have to show up. And so what's really going to be tough to track is like today, probably about half the people didn't show up you know, we just move it to the trial date because that's their mandatory appearance to show up. But we also move cases to the trial date that are gonna resolve or um, maybe they've been in touch with their defense attorney, they just haven't had a chance to agree to continuance. So not everybody, not everyone who gets moved to the trial calendar is technically an FDA. So I think that that's what's gonna make it even tough is, I mean, other than looking at the minute sheet, it's gonna be really tough to figure out you know, on these. And then I guess, are we counting an appearance in court just an agreed continuance order? Because now really all they have to do is contact, be in contact with the defense attorney and just agree to a continuance. And it's just signed by the defense attorney and us. So they don't, I mean, we have people who haven't been in court in probably two or three years. Um, Can I you know. address this? I, yeah. I guess, I, I mean, the whole reason I mean, this was changed for, the rules were changed for good reason. I mean, not just because of the pandemic, but also because um, access to justice issues and poverty issues like make it really make it difficult and people have work and kids and coming to court is an obstacle. And if they're in touch with their attorney and they have an agreement with their counsel that the matter is gonna be continued or confirmed for trial, there really is no reason for the person to come to the courtroom. Um, so I, I think that's a it's a good rule, and then they do have to have contact in order for the attorney to make any sort of assertion on the record. The FTAs that would count would be mandatory appearances that they fail to appear for, like their bench, their trial date. If they don't show up, they get a warrant, and it's very easy to count those. So I don't I don't see the problem that you're 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 presenting. Um, and also, in terms of the pretrial violations, I. All the state has, oh, we just, this, this is the defense is served of notice of a pretrial violation. I mean, we have to get our client to court if we get notice within proper time to, to have them appear in court. And I mean, that that's also still the rule. And or, you know, the hearing gets set and the judge says, I find good cause that the defendant has to appear if they're not here today. So they need to be here next week, counsel. We say, okay, and then if they don't make it to that, then they get a, a warrant. So I don't see it. I don't, I don't agree that there's a gap in the pretrial violation issues either if notice is properly served. So, um, you know, those, I just, I don't think, I think those are sort of non-issues. And I, I should have been clear. What I'm counting is, it's easy to count the bench warrants, but one of the tracking things on here is called a successful appearance. And I guess... I'm curious how we're going to track that. Is a successful appearance going to be granted when they're FTA for status? Because we have no way to track that because they're not getting well, a bench warrant. Let me ask you this. If they're FTA for, for the status hearing, so they don't appear, um, I think, Dave, you said that then um, the case is put over to the trial calendar. Um, yeah. And then they either appear at the tri trial calendar or they don't. If they yeah. don't appear at the trial calendar, then um, a warrant goes out at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. If they do appear at the trial calendar, um, does that mean the case will be tried 
or? No, it's just, it's continued. We just fill out a new order because they, they, weren't, they weren't able to maintain at the- The, the judge will usually say, um, the trial date will remain for other proceedings and the jury is stricken. Oh, okay. So, so it's not okay. truly, it's not maintained for trial because the defense counsel did not maintain it for trial. Okay. So neither neither the court nor the the lawyers are expecting a trial. concerned about are expecting to be going to trial, but the defendant remains under obligation to show up at the trial date because the defendant didn't show up at the status calendar. Yeah, because because the mandatory dates for appearance are trial and arraignment. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense to me. And um, you know, my initial reaction, Dave, and and um, Obviously, I'm not as current on these proceedings as uh, Judge Freeman would be and as you and Maya are, but my initial reaction is a failure to appear or failure to you know, successfully complete the appearance requirements in the pretrial orders um, would be tracked by um, what the defendant does. If the defendant doesn't show up for a status hearing and there's no agreement, it's put over to the trial date. If the defendant shows up for the trial date, I think the defendant has pretty much succeeded in that the case is staying on the court's calendar and a new trial date is being set and the defendant's given actual notice of that in court. Um, I mean, but the purpose of bail or any pretrial conditions is to assure that the defendant shows up for trial. And really the rest of it, the, the pretrial hearings, as long as the court rules um, deal with those issues to the satisfaction of uh, the judges and the appellate court, and it sounds like they do, our concern is, is more people not complying with their pretrial orders and not showing up for trial. That would, that, so not showing up for a hearing and at which a warrant is not in the picture because the defendant gets another chance to show up. To me, that's coming close to violating the pretrial order, but not enough for us to get concerned about it. If the, if the court finds that the defendant is not in compliance uh, because the defendant doesn't show up for trial, that's a different question for our statistics. The other factor that we're looking at that's you know separate from court appearances is uh, new crimes. And I think we do need to really be paying attention to that. I mean, clearly there's been a, a big increase in, in new charges being filed against defendants on pretrial. And I, I know from living in the community that that's a big concern currently for the community. Um, so, so I'm all for tracking that just as closely as we can. On the appearance question, I, I'm comfortable going with those cases in which the court issues a warrant and deferring to, uh, to the court's um, finding about in other words, deferring to the courts, if the court fails to issue a warrant for a failure, for any failure that the defendant makes in terms of appearing, I'll go with, with that as being an expression of the court's concern that the defendant is not in serious enough violation of the pretrial order to warrant a sanction um, when it comes to appearances. I'll go with what the court says. Uh, and track only those that involve warrants. I think that probably makes the statistics gathering more straightforward too. What do you think about that, Dave? Yeah, and I'm not as, I guess I'm not being as clear as I should be. I'm just saying this, the stats are gonna be skewed to, if it's written percentage that appear for all court hearings are really gonna be skewed, but because they're, they're not really, I guess if we put mandatory court hearings, it, it would be on there, but it, we're, we're gonna have a much higher percentage showing up because some of them aren't showing up, they're showing up late. But other than that, I don't, I don't really care about it. It's okay, just, 
yeah, it, it just it's just something to keep in mind that the percentages are going to be skewed on this just because of the way the system's set up, rightly or wrongly. That makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. And I think any review of those statistics, especially comparing them to those statistics from uh, years prior to 2021, um, has to go with that caveat that the court rules changed and changed significantly. Okay. Um, Anything else on our statistical discussion or you want to get into defining violent crime? Okay, the statistical discussion um, is tabled for now and um, I'll look, I'll talk with Judge Freeman about current court practices so I can be as up to date as uh, those of you who are um, in the, in the court system now. And I'll talk with Dave Reynolds and um, between John and Dave and me, we'll invite Caleb. Um, Caleb's last name is Hutton, is that right? What's? Eric Caleb Erickson. Erickson. All right, between, if you don't know somebody's last name, you're sunk on email. Okay, good, um, I'll talk with uh, Dave Reynolds and, and ultimately with Caleb. So that will put our statistics discussion onto our agenda for next month. Does anybody have anything to add to the statistics discussion for next month? Any, any other topic that's related that we ought to be covering or any questions? Okay, then the next thing is defining violent crime. And uh, I'm gonna turn the discussion over to you all. I have to leave my computer for just a moment because somebody's at my door. So um, why don't you start the discussion and um, we'll go from there. We've got the list here and that's appreciated. Rosie, it's okay, what's going on? Hi, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? I'm not sure. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I guess from yes. my perspective, I partly the reason why I was, you know, invited to be a part of the committee, I think, is my role in the LEAD program, which, uh, and I, I had mentioned it before at our last meeting. Um, it sounds like uh, Tommy, my supervisor, was able to connect with uh, someone from the pretrial services and um, get our, our regular roster of LEAD clients to them on a regular basis when he sends that out. Um, so I wonder how that, like even today, I mean, the reason I'm in my car is because, you know, unable to get back to the office because I'm out in the community dragging people to their court appearances and so they can comply to not dragging, but, uh, encouraging and getting people to, you know, their, their court, um, uh, commitments. So just how that, you know, if somebody is a lead client and then also engaging with pretrial services, um, how that might that statistic might also be uh, captured or, or if that's something that, yeah, we feel should be captured because uh, I feel like lead uh, clients definitely have a better, I mean, our success rate already has, has been shown. So uh, of people complying with court and not reoffending. So, um, so yeah, I think that should be a factor that judges should, should have in mind when they, when they appear and uh, they're deciding, you know, uh, pretrial release. So just want to throw that out there and just so that's considered. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Adam, I'm sorry, I had to leave for just a minute. Did you hear my saying that I had to leave? We did. Yeah. Oh, you did, okay. Um, can you just say in five words, the factor that you just described and I'll get the rest of it from the minutes, but. Sure. Um, in five words, <laughs> um, defendants uh, enrolled with lead services, um, and how that's how that data will be captured as well with pretrial. I know that was more than five words, but okay, that's fine. And I came in on the end of what you were saying; it was just the beginning. Thank you. I, I think Adam's point is is something we should consider capturing in that list we're gonna rank for performance measures. Um, if, if there's any way we could, uh, 
record uh, enrollment in LEAD or GRACE or any other diversion services because we'll be able to see, you know, what I expect will be improved outcomes uh, yeah. from the from that involvement, and that will that will provide more data in support of them, more justification for continuing or expanding them, funding them, all sorts of uh, valuable data. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, John, you may know this, uh, to the extent that a person is, um, is enrolled or beginning enrollment anyway with LEAD or GRACE or one of the programs, at the time that they're making their first appearance, is that information given to the judicial officer? Um, no, it's just uh, their first appearance is the PSA, the Public Safety Assessment. Right. The only thing that's provided to them. And the PSA, of course, doesn't include right. that. And usually we don't see them until after they're assigned to pretrial services and released from the jail. And a first yeah. appearance. And and they may not be involved at, at the time at, so early in the process anyway. They might get involved with lead or grace, uh, you know, at some point after their first appearance. Maya, is there anything you'd like to add on that? Well, those oh, that, I, that are involved, you know, defense counsel will usually glean that from conversation with the client and use it in argument. But sometimes also caseworkers will reach out when their client's in jail and inform the defense counsel who will bring it to the court, or sometimes the caseworker appears in court um, as well. So there's different ways the court can get informed of that, but yeah, I guess it would be nice if that was part of the pretrial report that went to the court. Yeah, I, but really, I, I, I can just say from doing the, the twos, uh, three o'clock, I can't think of a time where a lead person has not been represented or it's been not told in the court. Usually there's a lead person in the court every time letting them know how they're doing a lead what their what their programs are and i know adam can kind of clarify i know there's a couple of volunteers who were there also some days we don't have lead clients but i know pretty much that's always in front of the court i don't think there's ever a time the court doesn't know someone's on lead yeah and we we are so many people i think we do a really good job of making court appearances a priority but um there are there are instances where i need to be at like three places at the same time so there, there are people that could fall through and we have to kind of play catch up and see if see if the court is aware if, if somebody is is involved with lead. Um, so yeah, Tommy does a, a great job of sending that list out um, as often as possible. And we try to be at court appearances so that, you know, hey, they're with lead, um, if that's even a consideration in what's going on that day. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, especially as we expand um, and we have our caseloads uh, ramp up uh, based on the need. Um, there, there are going to be a lot of instances where we can't make it to every court appearance. So capturing that data uh, would, I think, would be useful and would take a lot of pressure off of us so that we can be out in the community and we can just kind of get a summary to the the um, uh, the public defender or prosecutor as needed, um, so that they can they can give that information. Similar to like a, a behavioral health, um, mental health. Uh, caseworkers. If we were to capture that data, how would we do that? Would it be by having it be part of the pretrial risk assessment report that pretrial services is going to be filing? That's a general question for anybody. I, I'm asking for a brainstorm rather than a definitive answer. I guess. Um... Wherever Tommy is, Tommy is sending that um, that list, that roster out to pretrial services. So they're initiating the, uh, or they're going through the, doing the pretrial assessment, correct? So if uh, so, I would assume that would just be a, a box, like just a reference to that roster. Okay, are they a lead member? You know, if their name's not on there, leave it blank. If, if they are, check yes. And however that weighs into the equation based on, the calculation of our success rate, I guess. So, or however that that stat would want to be weighed. That that would be my guess. Um, but yeah, I'm not seeing how things are being done on the back end. So I don't I don't know if that's more complicated than it than it will. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say that I have to say that you know we do intake 
with all of our clients before first appearance and ask them about services. Now, that's not to say everybody's an accurate reporter or someone may be experiencing a mental health episode where they're not able to really convey what services they're engaged in. So it could be that having a, a backup source of that information is critical for those folks. But for people who can articulate it, I mean, we, we do ask and relay that information at every hearing. It, it seems like information the defense counsel would want to get before the judge because it's an important factor. Um, I'm going to leave this one for us to think about. I, I We worked pretty hard to get a pretrial risk assessment form and, with qualities that we believe are most reflective of future performance. And um, I'm, I'm cautious about adding any uh, other factor at this point until we have a more, um, more reliable historic performance uh, history. And um, so I would at least want to think about this and you know to, to what extent we want to capture participation in alternative services, how, to the extent that we to what extent do we want to formally capture that? and keep track of it statistically. I'm not sure. Um, I, as I say, I feel cautious about including another factor. And so I'd like to have some time to think about it. And encourage the rest of you to think about it and we'll revisit this in a future meeting. Is that good? Any other comments? Okay. Next, um, defining a violent crime. Boy, uh, this list has some no brainers, murder in the first degree, uh, but it also has some that are less, are, are more subtle. What do you all think? Um, golly. Well, I raised my hand, I'll lower it. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Maya, I wasn't, I was looking at no, the- No problem. Yeah, go ahead. No problem. Um, I, I, I just went through the list and kind of looked through to determine if there were offenses on here that are not considered violent in the SRA and luring, uh, which is the second offense listed is a class C unranked felony that's a nonviolent felony. I don't know, so I'll just point these out. I. The other um, subversive activities made felony is a class B felony, but it is unranked and it's also classified as nonviolent. And then malicious harassment um, farther down the list is also a class C felony also categorized as nonviolent. So I don't know how these offenses were selected, but those three stand out to me as not typically considered violent offenses. I agree. Um, do you know what coercion of involuntary servitude is? Uh, I'm assuming that's a trafficking offense. I looked that up, sorry, I, hope I can check again. It seems like that would be a C felony, I don't know. Are, are, are we just going off of the SRA? Is that, I thought this was by the public safety assessment. Are we just looking? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the um, the introductory section on page one of the packet, that's what it says. It says the PSA, um, the specific offenses that meet the PSA definition are listed below. Who prepared this? I'm, I don't remember. We've worked with this for a while. I think this list was prepared by, um, by someone from your office, Dave, I'm not sure it was you, working with someone from Maya's office, it may have been Angela, when Angela was in our work group. Is this ringing a bell, Dave? No, I thought, isn't this just, I thought Dr. Peterson gave us this. From the, the I thought it came from the Arnold Foundation. And, yeah, and maybe, yeah, it, it comes from whoever does the evaluation okay. that we're using. Yeah, it comes from them, it doesn't come from, 
no, uh, the, the, I know what you're thinking about. We did, we did a list. We spent a lot of time on, though it's not being used on just certain crimes that, that wouldn't be go through an evaluation, go through yeah. the assessment. But I think that's been scrapped because it sounds like everyone goes through the assessment now anyway. So, um, but no, I, I thought this was just how they, for people who use their assessment, these are how they define it. I, I don't, don't know. I, what their analysis is, but coercion, coercion of involuntary servitude is a class C unranked nonviolent offense, just so you know. Well, I, yeah, there, there, I mean, there's a bunch on there that are unranked. There's, there's four. Gross, gross, gross misdemeanors, but can we change it if we're using their assessment? Well, I don't know. Dr. Peterson, yeah. it sounds like that could uh, create some problems. What do you think? Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know that it would. It, it certainly would if, if it were automated, say like the AOC had like, you know, pre-populated and pre-scored all these things. Um, however, if you're manually scoring it, <clears throat> you know, I, I think you'd have to, I, I don't know how that would, that would play out uh, functionally. I think you could certainly tell your own list. Um, yeah, and yes, to those that comment, I think you're right. This, if I recall, probably 2018 or 2019, I contacted someone from the Arnold Foundation and they had sent me this list. And I don't remember if, it, I, I wanna say maybe it was Spokane they had worked with to develop this list. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I circulated it then, uh, but I don't know if this is the original list I circulated or it's been it's been edited since then. Um, okay. But, but yeah, to, to your question, Judge Garrett, I think that, uh, you know, it's all being done manually, so it would, it, it's going to take work regardless. Um, I think you just have to decide what your reference list is for determining if it's a violent crime. I apologize, everybody. I need to jump off. We have to get somebody to into Spoke Park. So uh, thank you okay. all for this. Thanks, Adam. We'll see you next month, I hope. Take care. Okay. Um, Again, I'm, I'm always cautious about changing a standard form because, um, because it be, I, I'm cautious about creating an apples to oranges kind of comparison. But I do agree that a couple of the crimes listed here, they really, um, especially the class C felony ones, I'm troubled by including them. Does anybody else have thoughts on this? Well, I guess it's kind of a subjective definition. I mean, we're, we're going from so many defines where if we're just going to say, well, we're just going to define violent from the SRA, we could do that. But I mean, I think we, we could argue all these is luring violent. You know, a lot of people think luring is pretty violent. You know, it's not classified under the SRA as. So I guess one, I guess we have to decide our standard. I mean, that, that's why I was just kind of curious sounds like Dr. Peterson saying we can adjust our own standard. Um, that's why I'm kind of on your boat. I'd be more, you know, looking at this, but I, I guess if we're saying we're going to go off the SRA, then we would make some adjustments, but it, it, it'd just be tough for us to decide what is violent or is, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And you're right. There's a heavy element of subjectivity there. Stephen, you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I'm, I'm wondering what Dr. Peterson knows about whether other jurisdictions who have implemented the PSA are making these kinds of alterations as well. And sort of a secondary question is um, whether there's some importance that I may not be seeing in having some uniformity across jurisdictions for the PSA so that we can compare effectiveness uh, in outcomes. Uh, yeah, good questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think those are good questions. Um, you know, I think, well, there is some value in, in comparing across jurisdictions. You know, ultimately, this is a, a tool that's being used in Whatcom County. And so I think the, the people that, the representatives of Whatcom County should have something to with. Um, 
and, and I, I recognize that you know different sides are going to disagree on this. Um, I think there's always going to be some subjectivity and slippage between in comparisons because you know certain pros prosecutors' offices will charge the same fact pattern as one thing um, versus another thing, or use one RCW versus another RCW. So there's always going to be some of that there. Um, mm, that's true. Uh, and so I think, you know, the important thing is that, that you're comfortable with it. Uh, and, and it sounds like, you know, the, the agreement is with, I don't, you know, a, a large percentage of the list, the, the large majority of the list. And there are just kind of a few crimes on the edges that are probably rare crimes anyways, um, that, that are, you know, being considered. So I wouldn't, again, I, I would defer to, to be, you know, making sure that, that you all are comfortable with the list and not worry so much about uh, uniformity across jurisdictions or okay. uh, that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Um, oh, sorry, Judge Garrett. And also, I, I forgot the one question. Uh, I know that other counties at least reviewed the list. I don't know if they made changes. I can ask. Okay. If you could let us know, and particularly if you could let us know about Pierce County, um, since we got the statistics from you about Pierce County, and frankly, they look pretty good. If, if we could know that, that would be a good thing. I'll do so. Thank you. I'm just writing a, a note here. Okay. I think that covers our discussion of violent crime for today, unless anybody else has something to add. Um, I think that gets us through our three agenda items for today and gives us a plan for next meeting. Does anybody have anything to add? Okay, and I don't know if we have any members of the public attending our meeting who would like to make a comment. Jill, can you check that out? Yes, we do have one attendee today. If you'd like to speak to the work group, please virtually raise your hands now. No hands are raised. Okay, um, do we have other items that we should discuss or any questions before we end our meeting? Okay, hearing, hearing nothing, I'm gonna end our meeting. Thank you all for attending. It was good to see you, however, virtually. And uh, June 22nd, four weeks from today, same time and place.